This video is brought to you by Squarespace. September 2019, the month movies took over Broadway. On one street, you had The Lightning Thief that was getting ready to start its previews. A few blocks away, you had Beetlejuice that was about to start its remarkable TikTok comeback. And then meanwhile, online, Moulin Rouge, the cast album, was rising to the top of the Billboard charts. Nestled away at the August Wilson Theater, something else remarkable happened when a new up-and-coming actor named Renee Rapp took to the stage as Regina George in Mean Girls the Musical. But then, just six months after Renee Rapp took that first Broadway bow, the street went dark, and the show closed with a whimper. But now, four years later, the apex predator is back with a roar with the new Mean Girls the Movie, which is based on the musical that was based on the movie. So sit right down and grab your conveniently placed elf cosmetics, because it's time to talk about the movie, but then also look at if movie studios are actually onto something with this idea of not telling people that movie musicals are movie musicals. We definitely need to talk about Mean Girls. But of course, before we really dive into this review, I first need to thank this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace isn't your mom's website builder. It's a cool website builder with all the tools that you need to make fetch happen. Pro gallery tools can make your pictures pop, while the pre-built page layouts take all the guesswork out of designing your website. With their beautiful design tools, the limit does not exist to all the cool things you can create. With Squarespace, you can sit with us. So check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash wait in the wings to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. All right, with that out of the way, I just missed the trash can. So Mean Girls 2024, as we discussed in the intro, is a movie version of the Broadway musical. And it's directed by Samantha Jane and Arturo Perez Jr. It's got scriptwriter Tina Fey, who both wrote the movie and the musical, coming back to write the script for this one. And she's accompanied by her husband, Jeff Richmond, who composed the music for Broadway, who was also composing the music for the movie. It's the latest in this new trend that Hollywood studios are trying where they just blatantly don't tell audiences that they're musicals anymore. And while that certainly has riled up the internet, um, we're gonna talk a little bit later about if this method actually has some credence to it and if they might be onto something. We're gonna talk about that later on in the video, but all you need to know, Mean Girls the Musical, a new twist on the original movie is how they pitched this. So Mean Girls the Musical opened on Broadway in 2018. It was a very big commercial success. And in January of 2020, that's when they first announced that they were going to turn the musical into a movie. So then with the pandemic, understandably, the movie went into a pretty big limbo until finally in 2021, they found the directors and the studio said, yeah, we're going to turn this into a high priority project. The original plan was to put it onto Paramount Plus for streaming. But somewhere along the way, they decided, hey, maybe we should actually give it a theatrical run. And for the most part, it stays pretty true to the premise of the 2004 movie, where you have a new girl coming into school during the senior year. Her name's Katie, and she doesn't really know how to fit in or where to fit in until eventually she gets drawn to this vicious clique called the Plastics and their leader, Regina George, who at first seems very friendly and nice, but as the movie goes on, it turns out that she's not exactly what she appears to be. But then of course, chaos ensues when Katie gets feelings for Regina's ex-boyfriend, leading to two hours of identity crises, revenge tactics, and someone getting ran over by a bus. Now there's a lot that this movie does differently, not only compared to the 2004 version, but also to Broadway. You know, the trailer described it as, this isn't your mom's Mean Girls, which made me feel very old and sent me into an existential crisis. But really, they're, they're not wrong. It is for a different generation. 
Oli E. Cravalho, who became famous for playing Moana, appears in this as Katie's hardcore art friend Janice. And then fresh off his run in the Tony Award winning musical Strange Loop, I was stoked to see that Joquel Spivy was in it, playing Katie's other outcast friend Damien, who I think that Jaquel was probably the funniest part of the movie. But really, these two are your narrators through the whole thing. And when you have narrators, it's important that they're likable since you're going to be with them for two hours. And these two pull it off. A couple other standout performances came from B.B. Wood and Avantika, who assumed the roles as the plastics, as Gretchen and Kendra, respectively. And really what I loved from these two is that they were able to really steal the show with what I felt was pretty limited material. They only got a couple really good zinger lines to tell you who they were as characters, and I think they both pulled it off fantastic. But of course, the two actors who really carried the entire movie were Angoria Rice as Katie and our lord and savior, Renee Rapp, as Regina George. I'm not ashamed to admit that I did spend probably the first 30 minutes trying to figure out where I have seen Rice before. And then I finally made the connection that she plays Betty Brant in the Spider-Man movies. <laughs> really, I think that Rice does a great job of taking you on this journey with Katie because she does start out as wallpaper, but that's kind of how the script and the story wants it to be because through the whole thing, she undergoes this big transformation. Like she starts off as really smart and sweet. And then as the movie goes on and you start to see her kind of turn into a Regina 2.0, it really bums you out. It makes you pretty disappointed to see. Speaking of the Apex Predator, oh my God, Renee Rapp just owns this movie. And really what made Rapp's performance so rewarding is that she's in a position that not many Broadway stars get to be in, where you get to play one role on Broadway and then follow it up with performing it in the film. Which, thank God, Renee Rapp already starts off this film on a better foot than Ben Platt did with Darren Hansen, meaning she actually looks like she could be in high school. And even if she does look a little bit older than your traditional high school student, they at least cast other actors who looked similar in age to Renee Rapp, so she didn't stick out like a sore thumb. Of course, when you go into a movie like this, having seen the original, you're gonna make comparisons. And what a huge undertaking to have to follow in the footsteps of Rachel McAdams, who originated the role of Regina George. But when comparing the two approaches to it, something that happened with the 2004 version when I was watching it through is as soon as you meet Regina, you can really tell that she's not nice. Now, there's no denying that in my life, Meeting mean people sucks. But I think what's even worse than meeting people who are blatantly mean to your face are the ones who aren't. And Renee Rapp really does that type of person well here. Because when she first shows up, she genuinely feels pretty nice and like you'd want to be friends with her. But behind the eyes, you can see there's a whole nother monster hiding inside. And I just was so engaged by that performance as soon as I saw it because it was so authentic. And I think in presenting it that way, it made Regina that much more of a villain because it's so relatable. So let's move forward and let's talk a little bit about how they changed the story, not only from 2004, but also from Broadway. This was one addition that really could have been either super cringy or just really annoying but they really add in more social media. And social media, specifically TikTok, becomes a pretty big driving force of the narrative. Like I said before, this very easily could have gone from like older people trying to be like, this is what TikTok has to be, you know? It's like lots of cool filters and let's be dope. Or it could have gone the other way of, err, Phones are the devil and we should get rid of them and you should be ashamed that you use them. But this movie doesn't do that. It presents it in a very real way of TikTok is a part of our life. And I've had lots of friends who their kids are in school and they just use the phone like a normal person. It's just it's like what probably books were back in the 1700s. But then actually looking at 
the technical side of it, while there are a lot of things that this movie does get right, it also falls into a trap where you have so many ways of presenting information and you want to do all of them. But then what happens is that ends up detracting from the story. And it's just because I'm guilty of it that I was hyper aware of it, where they would introduce these really cool effects, but then never bring them back. And it just disjointed the film for me. So one second you'd have this film noir 1940s film grain style. And then the next you'd have eight TikTok filters. And it got to the point where it was a little bit too much variation and too much of look at these cool effects we could do that I ended up losing some of the plot. Of course, they weren't completely innocent because they still brought in that one effect that I just hate where they put the red button down at the bottom of the screen to show you that it's like a phone recording. Tell me if I'm wrong. When I go back and I'm watching a video I took on my phone, there's no red button at the bottom. It drives me mad when they do that. We must stop the red circle to show that it's a, that it's a phone video. I'm going to start a petition and I hope all of you will sign it. What I loved about adding social media is if you look at 2004, it was right when tech was kind of new and really you just you had like the texting where you had to hit the number six times to get to the letter that you wanted. So all the events that happened in the high school stayed in the high school. But with this new version, we're more connected than we've ever been. And it really adds a danger to the movie because now instead of these events happening just within the realm of this high school, they've got global ramifications and the reach is just so much wider and it plays a huge role in driving the story forward. And this cinematography really elevates the musical numbers because they choose to shoot them with these long tracking shots. This especially comes through in the musical numbers, Sexy and Somebody Gets Hurt. They do what Riverdale wishes they could have done with the big fun number in Heathers. Those two songs, they take place at this house party, which on paper, the set looks like a pretty limited space, but they find so many creative camera shots and ways to make that space feel so much bigger than it actually is. Instead of filming it as a by the numbers musical, they really film it like a music video. And this is my own personal bias. I like musicals that don't sound like musicals. The movie, instead of mixing it like a traditional cast album, it really mixes it more like a traditional pop song. Some people might like this, some people might not. Me personally, I loved it. I also love the BB Rexa version of Blue Dabba Dee Dabba Die, so take my opinion as you will. That being said, there were times where it got a little bit too musical theaterish for my taste. About 14 songs got cut, and I know that a lot of people were upset about this. Rest in peace, stop. But I actually think it serves the film better because a majority of the cut songs come from act two. Getting rid of those songs, it allows the story and the characters a little bit more room to breathe and to live in that world and the stakes. But then by having that big break, what it did is it broke the momentum they built up in act one that it was a musical. So then when people started singing after this probably 15 minute break of no songs, it was pretty jarring and it was starting with no momentum and having to drag this big wagon uphill with no running start. Let's talk about the stuff that wasn't quite so gruel. And I think we need to start with the, the blatant elf cosmetic placements. At one point, Damien asks Katie what she's doing as they're sitting in class. And she basically responds with, oh, this is elf coral shade number five. And then there's another part later on where they're getting ready for their dance and a bit of elf cosmetic rolls into the sink and miraculously it lands where you can read the label on the front. When this comes out on streaming, I promise that I will make a drinking game where you take a shot every time they reference elf cosmetics. 
But one of my favorite things about the movie was just being able to see so many people of different races, genders, sexual orientation, all on screen, just hanging out and just existing. They just put on screen what a high school looks like. But of course, the question I left the theater with was, did I like this more than the original 2004 version? I think that if I had the decision of you can either watch the 2004 version or you can watch the Mean Girls musical movie version, I think I'd choose the original. It's like when that Christmas Story sequel came out last year. If I had the choice between watching that one again at Christmas or the original Christmas Story, I'm just, I'm going to go to the original. It did leave me wondering how audiences would react to it who had no idea and who didn't like musicals. So really where this whole kerfuffle arose from was this Deadline article by Anthony D'Alessandro in which he talks about how movie studios didn't market Wonka as a musical. And the reason they didn't do that is because they found in focus groups that test audiences actually responded negatively if they knew it was a musical. So the way that studios interpreted this was the only way to get audiences in to see a musical was to trick them. This concept of general audiences not liking musicals isn't a new one. In fact, the entire idea of people not liking musicals isn't new. So this is something that I talked about a couple years ago when the Diana Pro Shot came out and everybody was talking about, oh, musicals are canceled. This is why musicals suck. I hate musicals. Nobody hates musicals. They just haven't found theirs yet. And it's wild because if you go back to that time when the Hamilton Pro Shot came out and it was this huge hit for Disney+, Plus, everybody was so stoked about this idea of how many new movie musicals and pro shots they were about to get. It was basically like the startup bubble of the late 2010s where it felt like every studio was announcing some new musical that was coming out or that they were starting production on. You had the Diana pro shot. You had Disney was gonna make the Once on This Island movie. Everyone was diving full in with the Broadway train. But then a couple of the first well, victims came out. But I wanted to know just how badly these gambles didn't pay off. So I went through and I looked at musicals that really promoted themselves as musicals and dove all into it with the marketing. And I compared it to the recent ones that promoted themselves as a new twist or a bold new take. Now it should be stated before we look at this that correlation does not exactly relate to causation and there are a lot of different variables at play here. So let's go back to a time before the pandemic and let's look at the movie that I really think doomed the genre. Let's look at Cats from 2019. In all, it ended its run with $75 million globally on a budget of $95 million, which I just don't know how this cost $95 million, but it did. So then we move forward to In the Heights, which everyone was very hyped about this and it ended its run with $45 million on a budget of $55 million. And then things just keep getting worse because you have Dear Evan Hansen, which ended its run with $19 million, and that was on a budget of $28 million. Tick Tick Boom, we can't really count because it was Netflix, it was a limited run, and Netflix doesn't release their numbers. But I think really what doomed the genre for a considerable time was West Side Story. West Side Story was a Spielberg movie. It was another huge $100 million budget. Globally, it made $76 million. So understandably, looking at all of those musicals that branded themselves as Hey, We're Musicals and the huge losses they took, of course the studios were gonna look for a different way to brand things. Of course, the one exception to this rule is Matilda the Musical, which made $35 million off a budget of $25 million. Now, these were all the most recent ones that really dove into promoting themselves as musicals. But I was wondering about the older ones that didn't necessarily dive into that. 
So I pulled a couple more stats looking at La La Land, Greatest Showman, and Rocket Man. La La Land ended its run with $472 million on a budget of $30 million. Greatest Showman ended its run with $439 million on a budget of just $84 million. Rocket Man ended its run with $195 million on a budget of $40 million. So even going back in time to almost 10 years ago, it does kind of look like there's some credence to this. But of course, times have changed. So the question now is, did these musicals that they're promoting now as bold new twist perform better than the last barrage of musicals we just got? So first we have Wonka, which that movie didn't even show people dancing in the trailer and I didn't even know it was a musical. It had a budget of $125 million. It currently has grossed $500 million. But then we look at The Color Purple, another one with a $100 million budget that did not market itself as a musical. It went with the bold new take and it's currently raked in $58.5 million on a $100 million budget. And then we look at Mean Girls, which is really the most current data we have. It had a budget of $36 million. And just off of the opening weekend alone, it's almost recouped. It's at $32 million. So looking at all of those numbers comparatively, I really hate to admit it, but I think the studios might be onto something here. I don't know what it is, but there's just something about the word musical that taps into preconceived notions of having to sit and listen to people sing show tunes for two hours. And another thing is, so what if these studios have to market it as not a musical? At least they're making musicals. At least they haven't lost complete faith in the genre. Because after the nightmare that was 2021 for movie musicals commercially, studios very easily could have said, we're not gonna do that anymore. The fact that they do see the value in it and that they still keep making them, that for me is enough of a reason that I'm happy the Mean Girls movie exists. And really the way I look at it is for years, there have been people around the globe who wanted to see Mean Girls but maybe they didn't live close to Broadway or they live in a place where tours don't come to them. What's so great about the movie is that it instantly makes the show accessible to those people who couldn't see it live. In many ways, Mean Girls 2024 does a great job of showing the power of the internet, a power that a small theater troupe called Team Star Kid experienced firsthand. Click on this video to learn about how Team Star Kid became a viral smash and took a huge gamble to turn the Oregon Trail video game into a musical.